I think you're good to go, Austin. All right, you let you letting the attendees into the Zoom. Great, thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. Today's meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. And what we're going to do today is to carry out a part of the Section 106 process. I want to make sure that uh, all the members of the Jones Library Building Committee can be heard. So I'm going to ask you to respond that you are present. Sharon Sherry. Here. George. Here. Farah. Here. Christine. Here. Paul. Present. Melissa. Here. Pam. Here. And Austin Sarah. We're all here. Okay. So I just want to say um, a word about what we're going to be doing this afternoon. The Section 106 review is a town process. The town acts in the role of the federal agency in making this determination. The town and the library have been in contact with the representatives at the appropriate state and federal agencies including the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, who has sent a representative to today's meeting. The town has hired subject matter experts to assist us in this work. And the work is to find, make findings of adverse effect and to draft a memorandum of agreement to address those findings and to identify mitigation. We're joined today by Ginny Adams, who's the senior architectural historian of the group, the Public Archaeological Laboratory, PAL. We've also hired professional facilitators to help conduct today's meeting. I'm now going to turn over the meeting to Mara Shulman and Jake Kuhn from Collaborative Resolutions Group, which is based in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I want to thank both our colleagues from PAL and our colleagues from the Collaborative Resolutions Group for the work that they will do today. So Mara, to you. I'm actually going to start us off. Thank you, Austin. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jake, and I'm here with my colleague Mara, and we are facilitators from Collaborative Resolutions Group, and we are a community mediation center and we serve Hampshire, Franklin, and Hamden counties in Western Massachusetts. Our organization's mission is to increase individuals and organizations' capacity to communicate effectively, manage differences, resolve conflict, and work collaboratively. We've been hired by the town of Amherst to facilitate this public meeting. We're both neutral facilitators whose goal it is to ensure that the meeting is run smoothly, inclusively, and respectfully. And I'll just note that I know I share a last name with an architect in Amherst. We do not have any relation. Thank Mara. you. Thank you very much. We understand that there are 12 organizations here today that are attending as consulting parties, and they've been assigned the designation of um, panelists. To ensure that it's clear who everyone is and which organization they're here on behalf, we um, will be doing a roll call. Um, we will call your, your name and your organization, ask you to unmute and indicate that you're here by saying here or present. That will help us um, be confident that everyone's mics are working before we start hearing from the consulting parties. So I'll start by um, with Jacob Robinson from the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce. Sarah Barr from Amherst College Community Engagement. I'm not hearing anybody so far. Madeline Helmer from the Amherst Historical Commission. Hetty Startup from Amherst Historical Commission. Jeff Lee from Amherst Historic Preservation Coalition. 
Again, I'm not so hearing Mara, anybody Mara, so far. Yes. Mara, it's Angela. If you could just slow down a little bit because um, I'm I'm pulling these people into the panelist room from the attendee room. Oh, I didn't realize that hadn't happened yet. I'm so no, sorry. No, they weren't given panelist links. So I'm pulling them in as you're saying their names. Um, so can can if we may, can we just start over? Of course. With the, your list yeah. of names, that would be great. Thank you for interjecting because I was was puzzled why I wasn't hearing any responses. So I appreciate you putting a pause there. So I'll just give you a moment to designate all of the panelists, um, and then I'll start again from the start from the top. Jacob Robinson from Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce. Present. Thank you. Sarah Barr, Amherst College Community Engagement. Present. Madeline Helmer, Amherst Historical Commission. Present. Hetty Startup, Amherst Historical Commission. Jeff Lee, Amherst Historic Preservation Coalition. Present. Liz Larson, Amherst Historical Society and Museum. Gigi Barno, Amherst Historical Society and Museum. Annika Lopez, Ancestral. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I heard someone speak. Was someone trying to respond for um, Amherst Historical Society and Museum? No, okay. Annika Lopez, Ancestral Bridges. She's on her way into the panel's room. It's Anika. Anika, thank you. Anika Lopes. Lopes. Anika Lopes. I'll give, I'll, I'll pause a moment here. <clears throat> Anika Lopes, is your mic working? I'm here. Thank you. Michael Hill. Hill. Also present. Liz, was that Liz or Gigi? It's Liz Larson, Amherst Historical Society. Wonderful, thank you. And do we have Gigi Barnhill from Amherst Historical Society and Museum? Gigi is not able to make it at this time. Thank you. Um, Michael Pill, Ancestral Bridges. Elisa Campbell, Burnett Art Gallery. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Nancy Ratner, I understand, will be attending as a representative along with Elizabeth Sharp from Downtown Amherst Historic District Committee, but only Elizabeth will be speaking. Elizabeth, is your mic working? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Jane Wald, Emily Dickinson Museum. I'm here. Ginny Hamilton, Friends of the Jones Library System. I'm here. Sharon Sherry, Jones Library. Here. Catherine Whitcomb, Jones Library. Here. And Sheila Murphy, Literacy Project. Sheila Murphy, Literacy Project. I just pulled her in, Mara. I'm sorry, it's Angela. She's That's on her okay. way into the panelist room. Wonderful. I'm here. Wonderful. And I do believe that I missed Kent Ferber. Uh, Faber from Ferber. Friends of Ferber. Ferber, and I'm here. Wonderful. Okay. So it looks like we have representatives from all 12 consulting parties. Um, thank you so much for confirming that your mic is working. That will allow us, it looks like a hand is raised. That will allow us to proceed. Um, and I'd like to just recognize that we have representatives, Max Sickler and Rachel Mangum from the Federal Advisory Council on Historic Preservation with us today. Thank you for attending. I'd like to just give you a moment to introduce yourselves and summarize the role of the ACHP and how you anticipate participating in today's public meeting. Hi, thank you. This is Rachel Mangum. I am an assistant director 
and the Office of Federal Agency Programs at the ACHP. Uh, the ACHP is the federal agency that wrote uh, the Section 106 regulations. So Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act requires that federal agencies take into account the effects of their undertakings on historic properties and provide the ACHP an opportunity to comment. Um, I did want to note uh, that we're at an early stage of consultation, and the reason my hand was raised is because I did not note or did not hear introduced anybody from the Massachusetts State Historic Preservation Office, and I just wondered, uh, were they invited to today's meeting, and did was there a response received? Because uh, Max and I, and I'll let Max introduce himself in just a second, are observers, but this is a, I would call it an early stage where uh, the town of Amherst acting as a HUD responsible entity is, as they said at the beginning, responsible for leading this Section 106 review. But uh, that review is carried out first with the State Historic Preservation Office and local consulting parties. And it's not until uh, there's a finding of adverse effect made that the ACHP is typically notified. So we are still at the stage where we're waiting to uh, hear the, the response from the Massachusetts State Historic Preservation Office and, you know, sort of understand or overhear the concerns uh, that may be expressed by consulting parties. Um, so I did want to just ask that question, is the SHPO here or were they invited? We'll hear more about um, that process momentarily from the uh, from Ginny Adams, but uh, I did see that Sharon had her hand raised. Uh, yes, they've been they've been notified, and we haven't heard from them for today's meeting. Okay, all right, thanks. And so let me just let Max introduce himself too. I'm sorry about that. Thanks. No, thank you, Rachel. Uh, yeah, and. Um... Glad to be here. I'm Max Sickler. I'm an assistant historic preservation specialist um, within the ACHP's Office of Federal Agency Programs. As Rachel mentioned, um, I am one of the initial intake reviewers for all HUD Part 50 and Part 58 um, adverse effects notifications that the ACHP receives. And this undertaking is one led by a um, Part 58 HUD responsible entity, that being the town of Amherst. Um, so, so far I've collaborated with Rachel as well as members of the town of Amherst, Amherst Library, um, friends of Amherst Library to uh, provide some some initial, as Rachel said, very early you know, assistance and, and guidance on navigating the Section 106 process. So Rachel and I are very happy to be here and um, we look forward to hearing the views and opinions of consulting parties. Thank you. And before we proceed, I want to just note that we had initially planned to ask consulting parties to change their name on the Zoom to their first name, comma, uh, organization that they're here on behalf so that it could be clear um, who you are representing when you speak. But we're finding that the name changes aren't necessarily being reflected in the bottom of the Zoom box uh, with your image. And so it looks to me as though changes are being reflected when a person's screen is off. So if you want to take a moment, go ahead and change your name to your first name, comma, your organization. Uh, I think that's a, a great thing to be doing, understanding that it's not necessarily going to show up on the screen unless if someone's camera is on. OK, um, before we proceed, we wanted to just kind of give a roadmap of what you can expect during today's meeting. There are different parts to this meeting, and I want to give a brief summary of what will be happening at each of those stages. As we've discussed, the town of Amherst has determined in accordance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act that the Jones Library renovation and expansion project will have an adverse effect on historic properties in the town of Amherst. So the first portion of this meeting will be dedicated to hearing from consulting parties. The second portion of the meeting will be dedicated to hearing from members of the public. Both the consulting parties and members of the public are invited to share their feedback about this finding and about what measures should be used to mitigate the adverse effects that the project will have on historic properties in the town of Amherst. This feedback will be used in crafting a memorandum of agreement following this meeting 
Ginny Adams from the Public Archaeology Laboratory will be discussing this component in much more detail shortly. I'll talk a little bit more about the consulting parties and their roles. These are people who come from agencies and organizations that responded affirmatively to the Town of Amherst invitation to participate in the development of the MOA, Memorandum of Agreement, to mitigate the adverse effects identified on the Jones Library. The consulting parties have expressed interest in the project and have been invited to give feedback, specifically from the perspective of their organization or institution. Each consulting party who's now been promoted to panelist in our Zoom webinar will have up to five minutes to share their organization's perspective on suitable steps to be incorporated into the MOA to lessen the impact of the project on the library and its historic surroundings. During the second portion of the meeting, when we turn to members of the public, you will also have an opportunity to share your feedback. We'll invite you to use the raise hand function later in the meeting on in your Zoom in order to ask you uh, to indicate that you would like to speak during this portion of the meeting. And we will ask members of the public to speak in the order that they raise their hands. Depending on how many people have indicated that they're interested in speaking during the second portion of the meeting, members of the public will have either two or three minutes to speak. If there are fewer than 15 people, three minutes can be allocated per person. If there are more than 15 people who are in interested in speaking during the public comment period, two minutes will be allocated. And this is to ensure that everyone here today has an opportunity to speak. Following this meeting, the library and the town in consultation with the Public Archaeology Lab will work with the Massachusetts Historical Commission to develop the MOA using previous input along with the feedback that they will have received today. The town will circulate the draft MOA to the consulting parties for feedback before it's finalized. And members of the public and the consulting parties are encouraged and invited to submit written, written feedback as well. The link for comments will be at the bottom, well presently is at the bottom of the town section 106 webpage, and we're going to share it on a slide at the end of this meeting. I'm going to turn it over to Jake before we begin hearing from our consulting parties. Thank you, Mara. And I also just wanted to note that if you if people wanted to change their name as it is a view, viewed in the panelist setting, you can click on the three dots in your box and click change panelist appearance, which is right underneath the rename, and then you can edit your name there. So your first name, comma, organization. So before we begin to open the floor for comment, we would like to establish some norms and ground rules for this meeting. We understand that there will be differences of opinion that will be expressed at this meeting that is to be expected. Here at Collaborative Resolutions Group, we understand that conflict is inevitable, but we how we manage conflict and how we communicate when there are differences makes the difference and determines whether conflict will be constructive or lead to harm. So accordingly, we are establishing the following norms for communicating during this meeting. The first one is show respect for other people. This means that we are agreeing not to use any disparaging language and we'll make sure that we are not using body language or facial expressions that undermine a culture of respect. The second norm is show respect for the space. We know that it's challenging to gather a large group of people to discuss an issue where there may be differences of opinion, and sometimes that it can be more challenging still when we're meeting virtually. When we ask everyone to agree to show respect for the space, this means that we are all agreeing that we're going to act within the parameters for participating that the facilitators have established. Specifically, people are agreeing to speak when it's their designated time to speak and not at other times. It also means that people are agreeing that when it's their designated time to speak, that their comments will be directly responsive to the scope of the meeting. And that's what Mara just went over. The third norm is speak for yourself or the organization you are here representing. This means that we are agreeing that when it's your turn to speak, you will speak for yourself or the organization you are here representing and not for other people. Everyone who wants to speak will have the chance to do so and will be invited to share their perspective. Those are the three norms. And now we will hear from Ginny Adams from the Public Archaeology Lab in more detail about Section 106, what has happened to lead to this public meeting, 
and what we can expect to see happen after it's been concluded. Ginny, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Jake. The Jones Library project requires a Section 106 review because it will receive a challenge infrastructure and capacity building grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and an Economic Development Initiative grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Federal regulations allow the town to act as the responsible entity to carry out the Section 106 process. This meeting is part of the public input for that process. Since there have been other agency reviews for the Jones Library project, I want to clarify that the Section 106 process differs from the voluntary application for historic tax credits. Section 106 and tax credits are two separate processes, even though the Massachusetts Historical Commission oversees both at the state level. The Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties has four treatment standards, each with guidelines. These treatments are preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. All four standards serve as general guidance for work on all historic properties and are widely used and have been adopted at the federal, state, and local levels. Within the regulatory context of the competitive tax credit program, the Massachusetts Historical Commission determined that certain aspects of the project do not meet the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties, specifically standards two, five, six, nine, and 10. Compliance with these standards is a regulatory requirement for receiving federal and state tax credits but different requirements apply to the federal section 106 process. The rehabilitation standards are used as general guidance for section 106, not as regulatory requirements. The section 106 process is more flexible and takes into consideration other factors, including the purpose of the project, public safety, or other measures. The Section 106 review is designed to weigh historic preservation needs with other public purposes. Slide one, please. Turning now to Section 106 review, which is triggered for the Jones Library Project by the use of federal funds, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 requires federal agencies to consider the effects on historic properties a projects they carry out, assist, fund, permit, license, or approve throughout the country. If a federal or federally assisted project has the potential to affect historic properties, a Section 106 review will take place. The Section 106 process laid out in the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation Regulations 36 CFR 800 gives the council, consulting parties, and the public the chance to weigh in on these matters before a final decision is, is made. There are four steps in the process the federal agency, in this case the town, undertakes as shown in the slide. The first is to initiate the process in which the federal agency defines the undertaking, identifies the State Historic Preservation Office and Tribal Historic Preservation Officers and has a plan to involve the public. The second step is to identify historic properties, which includes a determination of the area of potential effects or APE, where the project may impact historic properties, identification of historic properties, which are defined in the regulations and the National Register regulations uh, as districts, buildings, structures, sites, and objects listed or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. The Jones Library is, a, is contributing in the Amherst Central Business Historic District, which is listed in the National Register. In addition to this district, the Strong House and the Prospect Gaylord Historic District are now
to I'm sorry. Oh, there by we applying go. the criteria of adverse effects. May we have slide two, please? Thank you. Examples of adverse effects include physical, visual, atmospheric, noise, or vibration changes that alter the character and integrity of an historic property or its setting. And these are discussed in the bottom right, on the right side of the slide, and particularly in the bottom right. Adverse effects may be direct or indirect and may include effects reasonably foreseeable in the future or at a distance. While the project effects on various historic properties within an APE may be different, the federal agency makes one of three possible findings of effect for the project. The first is no effect in which there are no historic properties within the area of potential effect, or there are historic properties, but they will not be affected. A simple example would be repainting street lines within an historic district. The second type of finding is a no adverse effect, where there are historic properties in the APE, but the project will not have a negative effect on characteristics that qualify it for listing in the National Register. For example, properly preparing and repainting an historic building. And the third type of finding is an adverse effect in which there are historic properties within the APE and they will be impacted by the project. For example, through demolition of all or part of an historic building or structure. In assessing adverse effects for the Jones Library project, the town took it into consideration the history of the project and Massachusetts Historical Commission comments on the state historic tax credit application that I referred to earlier. As part of assessing adverse effects and consulting with the State Historic Preservation Officer, which is the Massachusetts Historical Commission, Native American tribes, if they choose to participate, other parties and the public, the town sent invitation letters to interested stakeholder parties, inviting them to be consulting parties and posted project information and a comment form on the town's Jones Library Section 106 review website. The federal agency, in this case, the town as the responsible entity after deliberations has made a section 106 finding of adverse effect for the Jones Library project as stated in the October 1, 2024 letter to the Massachusetts Historical Commission. May we go back to slide one, please? With a finding of adverse effect, the town has initiated consultation to resolve the adverse effects with the Massachusetts Historical Commission in their official role as the State Historic Preservation Office and consulting parties is involving the public and is keeping all the federal agencies informed on the process. As we've heard, representatives of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation are here at this meeting today as observers. This meeting is part of the public comment process. It's not a hearing and it's actually not required. Often the Section 106 process and participants are a much smaller group, but in public projects, especially when there is such interest, attention and care as for the Jones Library, the group engaged in the consultation process can be larger and meetings such as this are held. In the consultation process, the federal agency and consulting parties consider measures to avoid, minimize, or mitigate the adverse effect of the project on historic properties. For the Jones Library, many existing measures to avoid and minimize impacts have been raised, considered, and well vetted for over 10 years and meet existing funding standards all as reflected in the design plans. 
Examples of this type of avoidance include keeping the central stairwell, all the fireplaces, and 75% of the woodwork without any disturbance. Examples of minimizing impacts include scaling back the new addition from early plans for 110,000 square feet to current plans for 63,000 square feet. And on the original 1928 building, using synthetic slate to replace the existing slate roof and installing visually identical replacement windows to minimize the visual impact of those replacement exterior elements. To take this last example, for instance, if the Massachusetts Historical Commission did not agree with the Amherst Historical Commission decision that replacement windows are acceptable, the Amherst Historical Commission would need to consider this request in order for the town to issue a change order for the construction plan. The Section 106 process is intended to identify adverse effects if there are any, and find ways to resolve or mitigate them. Since the town has found that the project will have an adverse effect on historic properties, our purpose here today is to focus on mitigation ideas that will be stated in a Memorandum of Agreement, or MOA, that outlines specific measures to mitigate impacts. After this meeting, the town will draft and circulate an MOA for further comment before it is finalized and submitted to the appropriate agencies. The signed MOA will conclude the Section 106 review process. The implementation of the measures identified to resolve the adverse effects will confirm the town's compliance with Section 106. Although not detailed in the Advisory Council's regulations, some common standard mitigation strategies typically include completing archival photographic and written documentation with historic images of impacted historic property as a record before any change, changes are made. And also the development of, his, of a very wide range of historic interpretive displays, panels, and programs on the impacted historic properties. So the Section 106 Consulting Parties Meeting is a forum to exchange and explore interesting, creative, and collaborative ideas along these lines that will mitigate the adverse effects of the visual and the demolition alteration construction impacts of the project to historic properties. In the Consulting Parties dialogue and public comment that are next, we welcome your comments on the adverse effect finding. We want ideas for specific approaches on how to carry out measures such as archival recordation and historic interpretive exhibits and programs. And also invite thoughts on what other strategies might be considered to lessen visual and physical impacts of the project. And to reiterate, ideas can be submitted in writing as well using the online public forum. The next slide. Which will be shown, um, the, the, the link is on the, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And the link will uh, is on the slide here. Um, which also details a summary of the process. Thank you. Back tomorrow. Thanks, Ginny, for that very um, thorough um, explanation of, of where we are right now and what the purpose of this public meeting is. And I want to also thank Jake for discovering that you can change your name and uh, uh, on the Zoom by clicking on the panelist function. So please do that if you haven't already. Um, we're going to now he start hearing from the consulting parties, mm -hmm. and I'm going to uh, be calling um, consulting parties to speak in the order alphabetical order based on their organization that they're representing. However, we will be starting 
um, first with Catherine Whitcomb from the head, uh, the he head of special collections in the Jones Library, because we do want to hear from her about the plans that already exist to document changes to the building. After that, I will be calling on the consulting parties in alphabetical order based on the organization they're representing. If there are two people speaking on behalf of your organization, you can designate one person to speak or you can share the five minutes between you as you as you choose. There will be a timer function on the screen indicating the five minutes that each consulting party has to speak. And when that timer sounds, if you would please conclude your comments, then we can move on to the next consulting party. After we've done and heard from all of the consulting parties, there'll be an opportunity for uh, Ginny Adams to pose some specific questions to our panelists and hear from them uh, in flesh out some more details about what kinds of mitigation decks. So I'm going to start by turning it over to Catherine Whitcomb. And if um, Angela, if you could start the timer, please. Thank you, Mara, and thank you all for being here. Um, I am Catherine Whitcomb. I'm the head of special collections at the Jones, as we've already been said. Uh, our mitigation plans um, are rather simple, although um, they f uh, fit with the overall scheme or uh, the overall plan of special collections to um, document and preserve any and all changes to the building, to the history of the building. Um, we intend to do this through plans, through drawings, through photographs, interior and exterior, as many as we can get. Uh, and as I said, any and all changes, these materials will then become part of the permanent Jones Library collection, and they will be stored with the other items that show how the building has changed and evolved over the years. And the collection is available for the public to view at any time. Our finding aid, our finding aid is available online. Um, we update it as needed. We also plan to create a digital exhibit on digital Amherst and perhaps as well on the Jones Library website, tracing the history of the library from its original construction in 1927-28 through any current changes and future changes, and that will remain uh, permanently on the um, websites and change and added to as needed. Um, I look forward to hearing any other possible um, ideas that other people have for the other ways we could uh, mitigate the adverse effects of this particular project. Thank you. And with your remaining time, I'll pass it over to your colleague. Uh, no further comments for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll start now with Jacob from the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, no comments from the chamber at this time. Thank you very much. Next on our list, we have Sarah from Amherst College Community Engagement. Hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Mara said, my name is Sarah Barr. I work in the college's center for community engagement and i want to start by thanking everyone who contributed to the extensive documentation that we received last week um, i don't think i was quite prepared for about 700 pages of documentation but what really struck me in all of it all of this was the incredible thoroughness um, and the work that went into um, the documentation for this review but also the planning and the the balance uh, that uh, everyone is trying to strike to meet the needs of the community, um, to preserve the past, uh, and to find a workable path forward. Um, after reviewing all the material, I really walked away with the sense that the historic preservation efforts um, and, the, and the desire to document and preserve the information in the archives will help to make the um, library uh, safer, more environmentally friendly. Um, I was struck by some of the the, the physical concerns that I think um, exist within the building um, and will certainly make it a more, uh, uh, let me back up a second. I was also struck in the documentation about how 
the library has gone through these kinds of changes before. And so the library that exists currently um, no longer, or is not the same library as the past. And there were preservation efforts um, at the last time of change. I was also uh, struck by the fact that uh, there's sort of this interesting uh, chicken and egg situation with the historic preservation because um, the current archives um, are limited and that's part of what's included in the documentation. And so the expanded documentation will allow for further historic preservation within the broader community. Um, and also at the same time, preserve um, the story of the library for generations to come. So it is uh, it has been an incredible amount of work again, looking at the timelines over years and years that people have um, put in to make this possible. And I appreciate the, the hard work, the dedication, the consultants, the library staff, and the community members who have served on committees who have contributed um, to this process and uh, appreciate the balance that you've struck in preserving the building while also making it accessible and usable for future generations. Thank you, Sarah. I'll turn it over to Madeline from Amherst Historical Commission. Hello, um, Penny Startup and I will both be presenting. Um, so I'll just jump in. My name is Madeline Helmer. I am the vice chair of the Historical Commission. The commission deliberated the proposed project in fall of 2023 while I was absent on maternity leave. The proposed addition is found to have adverse effects to the library, to its neighboring stronghouse, and to the downtown historic district. Prior to any discussion of mitigation, we must first consider design alternatives to avoid damages to these historic properties. We can have a thriving library that serves our community while still, while still upholding historic preservation. These are not conflicting goals. I urge the lead agency in this process, the town of Amherst, to take action and require changes to the design. As MHC points out, the addition destroys the spatial relationships that characterize the historic library. Its size and massing are not compatible with a historic building and as it is not subordinate in scale and character. The addition is also not sufficiently differentiated from the existing library. The size and massing of the new addition impacts the historic character of the library, the landmark stronghouse, and our downtown. I propose the following recommendations in terms of size and massing. Size. In views northeast on Amity, the new addition extends 138 feet long. The existing building is 57 feet at this elevation. That means the existing building is less than half the length of the new addition. This length must be reduced to avoid overwhelming the existing building and its surroundings. The new addition is 43 feet tall at its rear wing, the same height as the existing library. The new addition's height must be reduced so that it is subordinate to the existing library rather than in competition. Massing. The new addition meets the west wall of the existing library with no clear setback or hyphen. There must be a distinction between old and new. A setback and a change in material will result in clear delineation of the new addition from the existing. So now that I've described design changes which must be addressed, I'd like to quickly address mitigation. Mitigation for this project can't be merely a documentation effort. A mitigation process must be commensurate with the project's impact. This project introduces a substantial impact, and so mitigation must be substantial as well. Um, so we can have a project that meets the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation while also achieving modern programmatic needs. It can be done, and if, if this project is designed carefully, we can find a way to celebrate and enhance a building that's already loved and used. I'll pass it over to Hetty. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline. The Jones Library, as built now, is complete on its site and is both historically and architecturally coherent from a design perspective. To, to the north, where the new addition is planned, there's a memorial garden and a view shed to our neighbors' gardens at the Historical Society. These elements should not be changed. Agreed, the Jones Library itself was altered in the 1960s and 1990s and is not perfect, yes. The atrium roof leaks, the fire protection and HVAC systems need replacing, and we need space here for our precious Civil War tablets, which you'll hear more about later. 
I know there are slates on the roof that have slipped or fallen, but structurally, the 1993 edition appears sound, and I have not heard anything otherwise to date. The POP report from earlier proposed a way of reorganizing the existing building without an addition being needed. I may be moving into the weeds too quickly, but I'm not satisfied that the Whipple window is going to end up being expressed in the new edition in a meaningful way. It will no longer be a window facing to the outside, but instead some kind of decorative feature inside. And this goes against the historical thinking over the last century and the last decades that the library trustees have thought through where they in the past and right from 1928 onwards sought to include motifs and even building elements from earlier iterations of the Jones Library and the Amherst Library as it was first called. Um, in, that's mentioned more in an article I've written, I'll put that in the comments. Um, in the past the trustees have maintained the roof slates and we should try to replace like with like, although I have accepted the synthetic slate as an option. I'm concerned that the book drop on the front elevation is still remaining on the drawings and I'm asking for it to be removed. We no longer see that the piece of equipment that's going to be in the space there is, um, is part of the proposal. All along, is that the end of my time? That is the sound, but please take a moment to conclude. We don't want you to stop mid-sentence. Okay, and I guess, um, so, this project is overblown and overreaching as an addition. It makes unnecessary intrusions into the 1928 building, such as the director's office being turned into a book sorting room. So I, I'm just concluding here that one thing in mitigation would be a National Register nomination um, for the Jones Library building, perhaps as a single building, or perhaps with the strong house next door to it, which I see as completing a kind of historic and coherent integral whole um, that I think deserves its own um, nomination to the National Register. Thanks. Thank you, Hetty. I'll hand it over to Jeff from Amherst Historic Preservation Coalition. Thanks, Mara. I was wondering if I could request an additional 30 seconds. I've timed my statement, but I don't want to read it so fast that you can't understand me. Yes, we just had additional a um, few moments after for Hetty, so I think that's fine. Okay, and I've already lost 15 seconds, but uh, anyway. The town has identified four adverse effects, and I quote, project will have an adverse effect on historic properties through the physical destruction of part of the Jones Library, alterations to interior circulation and historic materials, construction of a rear addition and changes to the visual setting, the Amherst Central Historic Business District, and the Strong House. The Amherst Historic Preservation Coalition would like to point out what we feel are five additional adverse effects not listed in the town assessment. One, re-roofing with synthetic slate rather than authentic Buckingham slate, which was identified by the Mass Historic Commission in November 2023. And they said, uh, though the town reports the unavail, or they didn't say this, but though the town reports the unavailability, unavailability of Buckingham slate, there are dealers across the country that still maintain supplies of the product. There are also other slate shingles, for example, Vermont slate that are commercially available and last 125 years or more. The lifespan of synthetic slate is roughly 50 years. Prior to this project, Jones Library Boards of Trustees have diligently maintained the slate roof using state and town CPA funds to perform the work. Two, removal of 25% of the historic millwork. The historic structure report states that nearly all of the irreplaceable millwork has been retained and is in very good condition considering its age. The 1993 edition expanded the library but made only minor alterations to the original historic building, according to the MHC. Three, the book drop hole cut into the main stone facade. Jones Library trustees have said that there is no longer a plan to purchase an automatic book sorter, rendering this hole unnecessary. Project architect gave as a reason that the outdoor book drop receptacle is too small and books are sometimes left on the ground, which is why the hole is needed. But a second receptacle would easily solve this. Four, loss of the Whipple window as an exterior window. The historic structure report describes the magnificent elliptical fan light Whipple window that was reused in the north 
exterior wall of the 1993 edition. It is not clear from the project notification form how this window will be treated. It does not appear to be remaining as an exterior window. Five, potential vibrational damage to the Stronghouse. The proposed expansion will require construction activity closer to the Stronghouse than previous work in 1993 and the 1960s. While the general contractor is required to carry liability insurance, it would be best to avoid this damage. Here are our proposed re resolutions. We believe that the Jones Library renovation expansion is currently designed, does drastic and permanent damage to the historic character and value of the building. We propose the following measures. One, avoid the impaired visual setting, visual incongru incongruity of the expansion and potential vibrational damage to the Stronghouse by eliminating the new addition. <clears throat> this will allow the Whipple window to remain as a functional external window. Two, avoid the loss of historic millwork and original circulation design by dropping plans to knock down walls in the 1928 building. Install security cameras in spaces where line of sight is deemed a priority. Three, avoid demolition of exterior walls of the 1928 building by repairing the atrium roof rather than demolishing and rebuilding the 1993 addition. Four, the entrance has a book drop, or the east entrance has a book drop, handrails, ramp, and automatic door opener. Retain it as a public entrance. Five, replace the Buckingham slate roof with a commercially available slate shingle, such as Vermont slate. And six, eliminate cutting of the Ashlar stone facade for a book drop. Hi, this is Janet. Here's our su suggested path forward. We believe that protecting the historic oh, character of the oh, Jones oh. Library could have been achieved if adverse effects okay. had been considered oh, wow. early in the planning process, as is called for by state and federal law. Instead, this review is being conducted after construction documents have been finished and the project already put out to bid. We believe that there is merit in the NEH and HUD awards at the undertaking not been coupled to a $15.6 million grant and associated demands from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, the MBLC. Regret regrettably, the MBLC has shown little interest in requiring the project to follow national standards for rehabilitation of a historic building. The MBLC has prioritized expanded space, increased programming, and an open floor plan, all of which have contributed to a design that adversely affects the library's historic character. We recommend implementing the avoidances stated above and working with NEH and HUD to determine if the town may still qualify for federal funding for the scaled back project that respects state and national standards. Jeff, for one moment, you can continue after this. Please continue. I'll read that last sentence. We recommend implementing the avoidances stated above and working with NEH and HUD to determine if the town may still qualify for federal funding the scaled back project that respects state and national standards for historic preservation. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We are next gonna hear from Liz from Amherst Historical Society and Museum. Hi, good afternoon. I am Liz Larson, the Executive Director of the Amherst Historical Society and Museum, speaking on behalf of the Board of Trustees regarding the impact of the proposed renovation and expansion of the Jones Library on this organization. The Amherst Historical Society was founded 125 years ago in 1899, nearly 30 years before the Jones Library took up residence at 43 Amity Street. We are in a mid 18th century building immediately abutting the library's property with a collection of nearly 8,000 objects pertaining to the history of our community. One of the stars of our collection is the Groom Tree, a 280-year-old sycamore that graces the front entrance of the Strong House. The largest and most valuable object is, of course, the 265-year-old Strong House, which houses our collection and serves as the administrative offices for the society. In preparation for the construction, the Historical Society applied for and received funding from the town of Amherst to do a structural engineering study to one establish a baseline for the house's physical structure, and two, identify any areas requiring attention before construction begins. Nothing of concern was found in this study. Additionally, we have consulted with arborists on protecting the trees and with structural engineers specializing in historic properties on monitoring seismic levels during construction. 
During the past 20 months, representatives of the Board of Trustees have had many meetings with the library trustees and the town regarding the protection of the trees, the collection, and the house. We have appreciated their willingness to listen to our concerns and to ensure that the needs of the historical society are part of the overall project conversation and ultimately will be part of the construction contract. Based on the above consultations and analysis, we have reached an agreement with the library trustees to grant a temporary easement along our property to allow for the work to be done, as well as a subterranean permanent easement for the retaining wall footings in the back corner of our garden. This agreement will be executed when a general contractor is selected for the project. Built into this agreement are safeguards for the house, the collection, and the trees. The trustees of the Amherst Historical Society take very seriously their responsibility for preserving these cultural assets for the community and know that the trustees of the Jones Library share this commitment. While the construction period will, of course, impact the visual landscape of our property, we believe that the benefits to the town and to the Amherst Historical Society of the renovation and expansion project far outweigh any temporary or permanent visual impact to visitors to the museum or to our programming. The mission of the Amherst Historical Society is to connect the community with the history and culture of the town of Amherst. While many may think that means that we collect objects, what we are actually collecting are the stories that these objects tell us. History does not exist in a physical structure or thing. It is the story, the connection that things create between people and communities across time. As fellow keepers of the stories of Amherst, we are so excited and pleased about the much needed improvements that the new facilities that the library will provide for special collections, as well as a new home for the Civil War tablets. In addition, the improved public gathering spaces will create, will create more opportunities to engage with one another and share our stories, continuing to build on the missions of both our organizations well into the future. And so once again, on behalf of the trustees of the Amherst Historical Society, I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank the Town of Amherst, Jones Library trustees, Jones Library Building Committee, and especially Sharon Sherry for all their dedication to envisioning a space for all to create new stories that will contribute to and become our shared history. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to Anika from Ancestral Bridges. Hello, everyone. Uh, excuse me for being off camera today. Uh, well, I want to uh, as well thank everyone for the amount of information that has come, and I'm sure we're all going to be continuing to delve into. Um, I am the founder of the Ancestral Bridges Foundation, but I'm going to step out of those shoes and right now speak to you as a descendant of the first Black and Afro-Indigenous families of Amherst and talk to you a bit about historic uh, preservation and properly supporting and including the history and culture of the Black and Indigenous families that predate the establishment of the town of Amherst. I have been invited and happily accepted the invitation to speak most closely to the Civil War tablets. And I do want to also share that, you know, my actual tablets are in the West Cemetery where depending on the map you're looking at, whether it is the black section, um, the Indian section, this is quite literally my entire family. I would like to also speak to what makes these tablets unique besides their stone, is the fact that for their time, they include the black and Afro indigenous residents of Amherst Mass, who served and sacrificed for their descendants and for future generations. Many of us who come from cultures that were not ever meant to know their histories and certainly not be an authority of it. Our histories have never been centered in the telling of Amherst history. And these tablets provide an opportunity to not only honor all 300 residents or more than 300 residents who served in the Union Army but also specifically what, again, what makes them unique is their inclusion of the Black residents. I would like to uplift a living descendant 
who is the sole curator and vision for the Civil War tablet exhibit. The photographs and the information, the oral history that accompanies this exhibit. Ms. Bridges honors her father by sharing and expanding the vision for the Civil War tablets, but her story goes deeper. She's an elder, a generational resident of Amherst. Again, her lineage predates the town of Amherst. She's a descendant of both genocide and enslavement in this land. And her words and spirit embody the living history, sharing present and future oral histories of this land. She is one of the only people that this is her story to tell. If you are indigenous or if you are an if you are an African American who is linked to enslavement in this land, this is your story to tell. If not, it's your story to uplift, support, promote, and share. And this is an excellent opportunity for the town of Amherst for the first time to represent and center this history as a true and accurate telling of this land. And I hope in going forward, we can see the opportunity as well with the Humanities Center to also bring forward other cultures that have come to Amherst after and who are telling their stories through descendants and give folks the opportunity as we have seen with both the Amherst Historical Society hosting the Ancestral Bridges and then exhibit, and then with Amherst College, also with the Amherst Historical Society being the first to host us to bring these stories on the wall. Most importantly, they've included descendants. I would just like to leave you with a few words from Cheryl Tawny Holly, who I, I read these words whenever I can. And Cheryl Holly is a Sanswat or chief from the Hasmanisco Nipmuc tribe. And I would like to share what she says with another exhibit we work on together. That is for centuries, others have told our stories in ways that made their worlds and their perspectives shine. Our communities were accessorized, a supporting cast to the greatness of others. Our truths never told. Venues for art and historic displays routinely lack community authenticity and rarely represent history and culture as perceived by those who lived it. And authenticity is crucial in telling the stories that accurately reflect the experience of both Black and Indigenous communities. I hope this project not only inspires um, Amherst to center their history, but also others to bring in descendant voices whenever possible. Thank you. Well, Nika, that was perfectly timed. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, pass it over, and I'm not sure if, if, it, if it's Eliza or Elisa from the Burnett Art Gallery. It's Elisa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Burnett Gallery is housed in the Jones Library. It is a gallery that invites shows by artists who live locally. People in Amherst are constantly saying that there's not enough places in Amherst for the display of all the art that's done by people who live here and nearby. And the Burnett Gallery is one of the more important galleries that does permit that. We look forward to having a better space in a revamped library one dedicated to being a gallery, one that people can find, and one that is accessible to people who use wheels to get around. The current location is not ideal. It's kind of a highway between some rooms and the elevators, as people know, in the current building are not really, they work, but just barely. So we look forward to joining with the other, in improvements in the library, including the tablets just described. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Elizabeth from Downtown Amherst Historic District Committee. Hello. Um, I am a member of the Local Historic District Commission and the members of the commission are in substantial agreement with my comments here today. In our work on the commission, we know that we don't need to sacrifice Amherst Prize cultural and historical resources in order to meet today's needs. But we're afraid that part of the design of the Jones Library does just that. 
There are two major adverse effects to be avoided. The first is that the massing of the addition is so oversized and out of scale with the original 1928 building and for the site and for the town in the town center that it dwarfs not only the original building but also the strong house next door. Presently, the strong house and the Jones are visually compatible neighbors emphasizing a shared past. Second, the destruction of most of the original interior floor plan and finished work is extremely unfortunate. The open floor plan conflicts not only with the original design, but how the building was meant to be enjoyed and has been enjoyed for 100 years. We propose these changes to be made to the design to preserve the distinctive features. Number one, uh, reduce the length and height of the addition. Use an architectural hyphen on the west facade to clearly separate the 1928 building from the new addition. This will require a jog in the floor plan and a shift in material and scale in order to achieve a clear delineation of the new from the old. In the present design, the mass of the addition butts up against the original building. Without some separation, um, there is no distinction, and you don't understand the rambling L of the old of the idea of the old Connecticut Valley home. A height fin was successfully added at the new addition to the North Amherst Library and within the renovation of the former Baptist Church by Amherst College. The church was built in 1843, and there is now an attractive glass entryway that bridges the church from the modern addition. Number two, replace the slate roof with real, real, slate. real slate. The roof is prominent a prominent self-defining feature at almost eye level. So it makes sense that it should be recreated with original materials. Nothing else looks and wears like real slate. And this particular slate there now was laid especially in graduated coursing, which we'd like to see repeated. There are contractors regionally and a supply source regionally. I will say that one of the members of our five member commission um, felt that a synthetic slate was just fine. Third, reinstall the wooden shutters. I haven't heard much about them. They originally flanked the windows on the stone facade of the center block. The louvered shutters had a strong visual impact, which emphasized the domestic look and scale of the building. The historic structure report tells us that the original hardware is still on the building and that an original pair of shutters exists from which a paint analysis could provide the original color. Fourth, uh, ensure that you match the color and texture of the mortar when repointing both the chimney and also the main facade. In all repointing, um, match it with multicolored mortar in texture and color that existed, how it existed in each specific place on the building. So um, it originally looked like it was um, assembled or um, put together on site. In the, 200, in the 2010 um, chimney restoration, that was not done and you just see one uniform um, color of mortar and it just doesn't look right. Uh, fifth, do not cut the front facade for a book drop. Um, find another solution because a cut will destroy the look of the facade. The harm of the cut will be made worse by you know there's going to be a sign above it telling you what and how to use this thing. So further losing the library director's office perhaps in the future um, as a beautiful wood paneled room would be a huge loss and contradictory to the spirit of the 1928 design. Six and finally, it's a small detail, but his, in historic preservation, details matter. Add back the pineapple leaves surrounding the pineapple finial in the pe pediment of the front door, as described in the historic structures report. Small details matter in historic preservation. In conclusion, our community cares about this building. Often historic preservation isn't on the tip of everyone's tongue, but it is in their mind's eye when they think about Amherst. And the Jones is an important marker of what Amherst is. When I first moved here 20 years ago, it was the Jones Library in the town hall that spoke volumes about how Amherst saw itself as a place of culture, craftsmanship, beauty, and public good and enjoyment. Let's make sure it speaks to future generations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move it on to Jane from the Emily Dickinson Museum. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jane Wald. I'm the executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, where uh, I've overseen many restoration, preservation, and infrastructure projects over the last 23 years. And now we're engaged in our first 
historic reconstruction project. So we're hitting at least three of the four uh, treatments uh, from the secretary's standards. Um, so I wanna thank you first for the opportunity to comment on the Jones Library Rehabilitation Project. Um, the Emily Dickinson Museum is a, is a neighboring institution right down the street with a preservation imperative as well as a large public audience that accesses our historic structures. So my first observation is that historic preservation is hard work. Our goals and intentions sometimes aim at an ideal state until we run into the realities of the condition of the building, surprises encountered only after construction begins, the need for modern systems uh, that mitigate longstanding problems, and how we make these structures living, vital, and useful for the purpose they're supposed to serve. So often preservation and restoration can accomplish their goals because the historic structure can be can adapt uh, its use to the overriding interest in the historic integrity of the building. And this is certainly the case with the homestead and the evergreens. It's really the category of rehabilitation that's more challenging in balancing the historic character with uh, the need to adapt to modern functions and audience needs. At its best, rehabilitation intrinsically carries forward the original vision for the use of the structure while keeping intact as much original fabric as possible. But sometimes the balance shifts. In the plans for the Jones Library, finding the best balance should aim to provide for the needs of mission-oriented operations and services to those uh, it serves. So from a preservation perspective, I'll comment mostly on the 1928 building and the impacts of the project on that. Um, in reading through all the information supplied for this forum, uh, and I'm especially, well, I'm grateful for all of it. Uh, it's all very useful, but I see six primary areas of concern and I'll comment briefly on a few of them. So the first is removals, modifications, and encapsulations of exterior walls on the 1928 building. These areas have already been significantly compromised by the 1993 addition, which itself is not a contributing component to the historic structure. Um, the historic resources assessment concludes that the majority of the work related to those uh, walls will not adversely affect the intact sections of the building. Um, from experience, um, uh, fabric that is too severely compromised, it's very difficult to bring it back. Uh, so it seems that a suitable, suitable approach to this concern, a minimal one, is thorough historical architectural photographic and video documentation of these components leading to a permanent online ex exhibition. And the videos should, uh, should show how the building components are being dismantled could be supplemented by 3D moving graphics, illustrating methods and techniques. Another area of concern is the use of synthetic slate and thermal divided light windows. In my mind, it's becoming clearer and clearer that historic preservation has to attend to issues of sustainability, whether it's ecological or climate change impacts, structural degradation uh, or economic sustainability. So pr proposed synthetic slate can reduce the structural load on the historic building and provide a sustainable resource solution. Modern divided light windows can contain uh, the original capital outlay and reduce operating costs without visual impact because of the de detailing of the materials and the distance from the street level. Uh, and so this seems a reasonable element of finding the right balance here. Now there will be interior alterations that modify circulation uh, and reduce the presence of some of the mill work. And I think this is probably the most difficult area. Um, while the intent is to maintain historic fabric, it's also been argued that these modifications will enable the library to serve the community uh, as a responsive uh, and vital public service based institution. So here I think is where um, the most difficult choices uh, will need to be made. Uh, and that uh, perhaps, um, you know, at, at a minimum, the, uh, the mitigation strategy could be the one mentioned above with extensive uh, online uh, documentation. However, if you wouldn't mind um, concluding your comments now, thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, 
So I agree that we'd like to see further clarification and explanation of the reuse of the Whipple window, the elimination of the book drop from the south facade, uh, and differentiation of the addition from the um, original building. Uh, and I'm glad, happy to learn about the agreement between the Strong House and the library uh, to uh, mitigate impacts on, on that structure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Now we have Ginny and Kent from Friends of the Jones Library. I'm not sure which of you will be speaking first, but please go ahead and then um, pass it over to your colleague once you've done. I think Ginny wants me to go first. I'm Kent Ferber, co-chair of the Capital Campaign Committee of the Friends of the Jones Library. I'm speaking on behalf of the hundreds of donors who have made gifts to support this project. The historic portion of the Jones Library building was not designed to be ossified as a museum. It was intended to be a working library slash community center, meeting the needs of Amherst residents of its day. Samuel Minus Jones funding required that it be built for that purpose. Today, with hundreds of thousands of visitors of all kinds, children, teens, adults, community groups, English language learners, differently abled, computer users, history buffs, not to say bar book borrowers and readers, those needs for space, uh, accessibility, and security are dramatically different from those when the building was built 100 years ago. The need to preserve the historic assets of this building is certainly high, but what is being proposed is a classic example of historic rehabilitation. In the words of the National Park Service standards, quote, making possible and efficient compatible use for a property through repair, alterations, and additions while preserving those portions, <clears throat> excuse me, those portions are features that convey its historical, cultural, or architectural values. I should remind everyone that these historic assets of this building are at risk. If this building project does not go through, no one has proposed any other way of financing their preservation, and we now understand how expensive that can be and all of the proposals being made for alterations to the plan have no underpinning of any reasonable kind of financing. All of the money being raised for this, including the town's contribution to this, are funding the, this particular project. Uh, the extensive changes to the historic structure made by the 1993 edition are an example of the kind of difficult decisions that might be made when funding is scarce and it does not come with historic preservation requirements. And that, contrary to what was said before, those changes were extensive. I applaud the proposal of Catherine Whit Whitcomb and the archives uh, to document the and make public the uh, present state of the building and its historic value. And I suggest that that's a reasonable way to, to preserve for the future the assets of this building. This is an exceedingly complicated carefully crafted, crafted solution to a host of problems the town faces, preserving what is essential about the building's history while allowing it to meet today's challenges. We urge the consulting parties to agree on a simple set of mitigating measures that will allow it to proceed. Ginny? Thanks, Kent. I'm Ginny Hamilton, the staff person for the Friends of the Jones Library, um, managing the capital campaign fundraising. And all I will add is specifics regarding the National Endowment for the Humanities grant, because I was the primary person writing that grant. Um, NEH has been very supportive in helping us understand the the hoops we need to jump through for this funding. And I want to be clear that their funding is for the expansion portions of the building, expanding the space we have for special collections, both archives and, um, and display areas, creating a permanent home for the Civil War tablets that Anika spoke of before, and providing community space um, for um, literary and humanities programming happening in that is not available currently downtown. So while we are aware of the necessity of these reviews to protect the old as we build the new, um, that funding um, is contingent on, um, on the expansion plans that are put forth. Thank you, Ginny. Um, last, we have Sheila from the Literacy Project. Hi, everybody. 
Um, I'm here representing the Literacy Project. The Literacy Project uh, is a community-based nonprofit organization that provides free classes to adults and out-of-school youth who want to get their high school equivalency credential. Um, we are the adult basic education provider in Franklin and Hampshire counties, and we have classrooms in Greenfield, Orange, Northampton, East Hampton, and Ware. And until 2020, we had a classroom in Amherst as well. But since then, we've been serving Amherst residents in remote classes that meet on Zoom. And a little bit about our students in Amherst. Half the students we see from Amherst are immigrants from a variety of countries around the world. Some have their a high school credential from their home country uh, and need to gain more skills in reading and writing in English so that they can go on a college. And others didn't weren't able to complete their secondary school education in their home country and um, need a high school credential here in order to be able to get a decent job uh, and continue their education. Our classroom in Amherst opened 29 years ago in 1995. In 2011, we could no longer find affordable classroom space of our own in Amherst. And from 2011 to 2020, the Jewish community of Amherst hosted our classrooms in their space. But since 2020, we've not had space and have only been able to serve Amherst residents in remote classes. So early on in our search for affordable classroom space, actually since 2011, uh, we approached the Jones Library and have been beyond happy and grateful to have classroom space uh, for our classes included in this expansion project. So um, while we continue to look for space to use in the interim, we're also looking forward to once again, serving Amherst residents uh, in in their community and in the setting of the Jones Library. Uh, so um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to um, make our students visible, those Amherst residents who are our students visible as, um, beneficiary, as future beneficiaries of this project. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. We've heard from all of the consulting parties now, and we're going to reserve some time to ask Jenny Adams from the Public Archaeology Lab to pose some questions to the consulting parties to deliberate a bit more about the measures that can be used to mitigate adverse effects. Um, so Ginny will be asking questions, and if you'd like to respond, I'd ask that you raise your hand, use the raise your hand function, and I'll be calling on the consulting parties to respond to Ginny's questions in the order that the hands are raised. We have about um, 30 minutes for this portion of the meeting before we move into the public comment. Ginny? I thought I would start by thanking everyone for their comments. And there is some overlap amongst them. I have a few questions to ask that will bring up some of the things that were discussed that that folks have brought forward. And I'll just say what those are to begin with so you have uh, some sense of where we're going. And the first is uh, the adverse effect findings. Several people commented about the adverse effect findings, the visual impact of the new addition, and then the uh, impact to the Jones Library itself. And then there were also some comments about the mitigation strategies of recordation and about interpretive displays and programs. So let's start with the question about the visual impact of the project and ideas that you may have to augment what's already been said. Oh, Jenny, I believe you're speaking, but I can't hear your Please voice. Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak on that question. Thank you. And the visual, the visual impact. 
And we did hear some comments earlier from consulting parties regarding the impact, uh, a visual impact. So if you wanted to speak again on that subject or engage in some dialogue on that subject, now would be the time to raise your hands if you have comments or questions regarding the visual impacts of the project. I'll give people a moment to deliberate and think whether they would like to raise their hands. Yes, Elizabeth. Um, I spoke about the visual impact. I think um, the addition is just massive and it overwhelms the existing structure. The one thing that I could think of to do is on the west side is to redesign the link between the old and the new so that you create you make an indentation of some sort, you change the materials and you create some kind of a visual hyphen or something or another, which have been used successfully in other historic preservation projects. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jeff, please. I would just point out that the town's adverse effects assessment points out that the new addition will be visible from the from three different historic districts, uh, obstructing the view of the historic building, and I find that troubling. Thank you. Jeff, do you have any um, mitigating measures that you'd like to propose with respect to that impact? Uh, yeah, my well, as I said in my statement, I believe that we should avoid building the new addition that would solve the problem. Okay, thank you. I see Liz has their hand raised. Uh, yeah, I actually think the uh, rear addition is going to better activate the space back there. And from our perspective, I'm actually looking at it right now from my office, it will better incorporate our two spaces and make them more uh, able to engage with each other and for the public to have more of a uh, interactive space uh, back here. Thank you, Liz. I see Sharon has their hand raised. Hi, thank you. Um, a, a couple of things: the back, the back, the backyard, the back garden space. Uh, we've got a lot of safety issues occurring back there, um, and so um, the the, uh, the renovation, the landscaping work that will be done back there will uh, will will fix those safety problems. The the bushes and and trees are just much too. Um, it, it, it's more of a, a personal space, a personal garden, a, a home garden, as opposed to a public garden. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention was the book drop. Um, I completely understand not wanting to um, have a book drop in the front of the building, but from the point of view of running a library, even though we won't have the automated machine in, in this front space here, Patrons do need to return the books, and it's um, and, and so being able to have a front return so people can return it while the library is closed, as well as when they walk in, all coming into this room um, is is very much required uh, for the operation of the building. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Were there any other comments or questions regarding the visual impacts? And remember, we're talking about um, measures that can be used to mitigate adverse impacts. Yes, I see that Hetty has their hand raised. So visual impact is, in an architectural sense, going to imply some materiality. It's going to imply a way for us to actually experience and walk through these spaces. Um, what we have historically with the relationship of the Strong House to the Jones Library is a very interesting piece of Amherst's history, which is the, the ability to embrace the colonial revival architectural style and have a conversation between those two buildings about that. Strong House is 1744, the Amherst Historical Society 
moves into that building. And right after that is this incredible time in Amherst when the college and the town begin to build the Jones Library, the 1928 building, and the Amherst College fraternities that used to exist. Most of them are designed by the people who designed the Jones Library. And I think by putting that new addition on the back, that will forever change that relationship of those two buildings and that part of our history. Ginny, you ask about visual impact. Um, I think it's not, we're not looking at pictures and photographs and plans. We're looking and moving through space and moving through the downtown of Amherst in the central business district. And a lot of people came to Amherst because they came to look at this place that really observes its historical precedents. Um, there's a piece of the foundation of the Amherst Hotel in the Jones Library Foundation. This is, this is a, a building where along the way there have been very careful conversations back in time to the past. And I, I just think that we should be trying to do that now. Thanks. Thank you, Hetty. I see Sharon has their hand raised. Um, I, let me talk next about the, the size of the addition. Um, <laughs> honestly, if the addition could have been smaller, or, or, or not at all, that would have been fabulous. We would have jumped on that, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago when this project started. The fact is that the Jones Library is the, the, the 20th busiest public library in the state of Massachusetts. Out of 352 communities, people are coming here, people are using us in part because it's a beautiful building, but also because these library services are so important. And so when you do the math, the additional square footage is needed. And one of the things that uh, FAA, the architects have focused on since day one is making sure that the addition falls in line with all of the setbacks. The fact that we've got this beautiful historic society on one side of us and this beautiful old bank building on the other side of us and fitting to the requirement of not being higher than the 1928 original portion of the building. FAA, Feingold Alexander Architects have done that since the beginning. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about that. Thank you, I'd like to turn it over to Kent. Yes, I just would reinforce what Sharon said about Feingold Alexander, this has been the, the exterior appearance, the impact of this building on uh, the um, on the visual uh, uh, downtown Amherst has been forefront in their minds. They are experienced architects. They have reassured us that it works, that it doesn't overshadow the the original building. And I would certainly take their professional judgment uh, over anybody else who's given their track record with historic uh, preservation architecture. Thank you. Thank you. So Ginny had prompted us to think not only about the visual impact and mitigating measures that can be take, taken to minimize that, but also what kinds of um, features and components should be documented and in, in, in terms of interpretive displays. She um, described some of the mitigating measures that can, have been used in other projects. Can we turn to that question now? Are there mitigating measures along, along these lines that the consulting parties would like to propose in addition to those that were already described by Catherine earlier from the Jones Library? Um, we would love to hear from consulting parties if they have ideas about that particular area. So please, again, raise your hand if you have a comment or question you wanna make and I'll call on names in the order that the hands are raised. And Ginny, while people are thinking, if you want, perhaps it'd be helpful to um, refresh our minds about what kinds of um, mitigation measures have been used along these lines in other projects. Sure. This kind of documentation follows a standard that's established um, at the federal level by um, the National Park Service. And 
the documentation is archival, the packaging is archival so that it, it is a permanent record. Any photographs, narrative text are all done on our archival paper. And the documentation covers as much of the overall and detail of the resource that is necessary and desired in order to document what it looks like before any changes are, are made. So it's done through very high quality photography, very detailed written narrative, a lot of historic images, historic maps, and depending on the and and, and uh, architectural drawings, photographs, those can all be packaged in with the documentation. Thank you, Jenny. I see that Jenny H has their hand raised. Thanks. So I've had a couple ideas for for going beyond just photographs, and it actually includes some of the people in this room. So I start with, um, uh, please don't kill me for <laughs> suggesting more work for some of you. Um, but uh, in one instance, one of the capital campaign donors is a regular volunteer at the Dickinson Museum. And when we um, one of her questions has been, you know, what is staying open during construction of the archives? Because they often send Dickinson Museum volunteers or visitors to the Jones Archives for the, the Dickinson collection that, that um, Catherine oversees. So I don't know if this is possible or even uh, acceptable in archives. Uh, land, but I wonder whether there might be pieces of the Jones collection that could live at the Dickinson Museum during the closure and that that might be a partnership that could happen here. Um, similarly, I know Ancestral Bridges has had a display at Amherst College in the Frost Library um, for the past couple of years. And so I'm you know, wondering again whether the college itself, whether it's at the frost or the mead or or such, whether there are other ways, and obviously lives in the historic uh, society next door. Like, are there are there pieces um, of the Jones collection, or <laughs> for that matter, pieces of the Jones, if if there are pieces going away, that um, that we want to make into something more interactive um, in some of our other partner places in the community, or um, you know. Are there, Sheila, are there writing projects that some of your students could do about the library? Like, I'm just wondering if there could be, what possibilities this gives given the richness of the organizations that are here um, in this conversation. Thank you. I see Elizabeth has raised their hand and then Kent. Hi. Um, I think it's fantastic to document any changes, and that's really, really important, and I'm glad you're thinking about um, using really good photography, etc. But I would have thought that would have been standard operating procedure on a project like this, so I don't really see it as a mitigation um, factor. I see it more as something that you would do anyway when you do a kind of um, um, historical preservation or rehabilitation project. Thank you, Elizabeth. Kent? Yes, I just have a couple of maybe too much detailed suggestions, one of which is that all of us have been to museums which have, uh, I wouldn't call them interactive, but video exhibits. You press a button and you hear a five minute uh, narration with photographs of uh, uh, whatever is being featured in the museum. And remember that in contrast to the present layout or any conceivable layout that's being proposed, the exhibit room of special collections will now be publicly available. That is, you will not have to find your way back up in the back of beyond to find it. It's right inside the front door and it will be able to feature for every single resident who visits the library, the history of the town, including the history of this building and making something like that exhibit available, I, my guess would be quite popular. And secondly, it, the, I have seen uh, detailed professional photographs of each of the interior rooms of the 1928 library as originally furnished. Mounting those pictures in the same rooms 
with the same woodwork and at the same scale, but demonstrating how differently the room needs to be used today, it seems to be would be an important lesson in history that would work extremely well. I'll just give a couple of detailed uh, suggestions. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to that area? Yes, Jeff. Yes, I'm sorry, but the idea of documenting uh, rooms and features that Amherst residents have been able to experience and enjoy for decades uh, just seems wholly inadequate to me. And it's, I know there have been arguments that we need to move, we need to modernize the library, but there have been surveys, townwide surveys, where the residents were perfectly satisfied with the old library. This was done at the time after the grant proposal was made to the MBLC. Um, we have trustees on record as saying we have a problem and that the trust that the patrons really like the library as it is. So I really hope you would consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Ken, I see your hand is raised. Yes, I would just respond by reminding everybody that 65% of the population of Amherst who voted in November of 2021 voted in favor of a project that is virtually identical to this one being proposed. Yes, there are a few changes, but basically what the town voted for, the population of the town, the majority, an overwhelming majority of the town voted for these changes, and that should be noted. Thank you. Sarah, your hand is raised. Hi, the question that we're answering is about um, ideas for preserving and uh, maintaining the information. Is that right? That's right. So I, I want to follow up on Ginny's request of partners. Um, I represent Amherst College, and I just want to say that, you know, um, we're excited to partner with the library, particularly around the archives and special collections. Um, to ensure that the town's history is preserved. I think one of the, the big challenges that's faced in the local community is that the Jones Library is out of space. Um, and so there is the loss, um, and there has been the loss of, I think, a lot of historic documents and information related to the town's history, particularly that of the African-American and Afro-Indigenous history, which is part of the reason why Amherst College partnered with the Ancestral Bridges to build the exhibit um, in Frost Library. So, you know, we are certainly very committed to supporting the town as it preserves its history. And um, I can imagine lots of ways to, to partner to ensure um, that the library is able to find really good strategies to document um, the library as it is, um, expand what it's collecting, um, and really help to ensure that the full story of the town's history is preserved and available. Um, in addition to obviously what we're talking about now, which is the the history and story of this building. So, you know, I certainly look forward to partnering with the Jones Library um, and the other organizations on this call, because uh, I think we all share a, a common goal of, of preserving um, and making available the town's history uh, to current uh, members of the community and the generations that will come um, ahead of us. Thank you, Sarah. I see Catherine has their hand raised. I just wanted to say thank you for all of these excellent ideas. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, making some real um, good partnerships with some of the local agencies and continuing to grow some of the ones we already have. Um, and I hope that if other people come across or come up with other ideas later, that they please reach out. Um, the meeting doesn't end right here. So if you ha if you come across uh, come up with an idea tomorrow, the next day, you know, our our um, emails on the website. So thank you, Catherine. And I think since there are no other hands raised, this is um, oh, um, I see Madeline has their hand raised. Please, Madeline. Um, yeah, we were also discussing how potentially the. Um, landscape features that were value engineered um, out of the design could be reinstated to reduce the, the impacts to the public, um, to the public's experience of the site and views. Madeline. These include 
Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask you to be more specific, but it sounds like you were about to do that. Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, they included ocean cladding on the retaining wall, mm -hmm. details of the children's patio, landscaping at the rear. Um, uh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So, um, yes, we're going to be concluding this portion of the meeting now that all the consulting parties have had a chance to speak and have had a chance to engage in this facilitated conversation prompted by Ginny's questions. I do want to remind everyone that um, that there is the opportunity to continue to provide comment through the town's website. The website will be provided again at the end of the meeting. But all of the feedback and ideas shared today will be um, considered and as the memorandum of agreement is crafted. And so please, it's important to continue to share your ideas. Um, and I do see that Hetty has their hand raised. So before I transition um, into the next stage of the meeting, I will give Hetty a chance to speak. Hetty, I do believe that you're muted. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm unmuted um i do believe that um just the documentation isn't really sufficient at this point i would be in favor of a special single building nomination to the national register for the jones library in order to protect it from further impacts on its historic character and on the the block that includes the strong museum um you know what what that's that's the visual impact that's the historical significance and architectural significance of this site and that's what the new edition doesn't really honor in any way i'm very respectful of faa i think they've done good work elsewhere i think they did great work at the holyoke public library but our library is not designed in the same way or in the same architectural style as the holyoke public library and so I think um, a single nomination to the register or perhaps one in partnership with the Strong Museum that would preserve this conversation between these two buildings would be very helpful in future years and that could be part of the packet that um, would be for the archive and special collections. I use special collections on a regular basis. I'm aware of the space right now and I'm also a very privileged white person who enters the elevator and goes up to the third floor to use that space. I'm sure there are other ways that can be done to mitigate and improve that area without the new addition. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your participation and comments. And I want to just encourage everyone, if you haven't done this already, to put your specific proposals around mitigation measures in writing and submit them at the Town of Amherst website. We're going to be concluding this first portion of the meeting with our consulting parties. The consulting parties will be returned um, to the regular attendees list, and we are going to be moving into the public comment portion of the meeting. Jake will be facilitating that. Oh, Mara, I see Sarah. Yes, Mara, there's a hand Angela. raised. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's Angela. I was just hoping before we go into the next phase, if you could just give me two minutes to move people over. That would be yes. really helpful. And then also two minutes for people to just come up for air and take a break before we move into the next segment. Yeah, I was going to start by saying that we should take a couple of minutes for people to have a bio break and stretch their legs um, at, before we start the next portion. So it's 2.24 right now. Uh, why don't we come back at 2.28? So there's enough time for you to do the switching over and people have time to stretch their legs. Thank you, Jake.
All right, welcome back everybody. We'll give everyone a minute to turn their video back on before we start up again. So we are going to be moving into the public comment section of the meeting. And all the attendees from the public should be in the panelist section of the meeting now. Angela, let me know if you still need some time to move anyone else over. Uh, so if you haven't already, please use the raise hand function if you would like to share a public comment this afternoon. And if you are participating by phone rather than Zoom, you can press asterisk nine on your keypad. We're going to ask members of the public to speak in the order of the raised hands. Based on the number of people who have raised their hands, each person will have two or three minutes to speak. If there are fewer than 15 people, three minutes. If there are more than 15 people, two minutes. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, address, and pronouns. Before we start receiving public comment though, I do wanna just review the norms that we established earlier, which will allow us to create a process that is inclusive of, inclusive of different opinions and respectful to all. Again, our norms are one, to show respect for other people, two, to show respect for the space, and three, to speak for yourself and not for others. So Jake, it's Angela. Um, we are bringing the, um members of the Jones Library Building Committee back in as panelists. And I think we're asking the public during public comment to speak from the attendee room. Okay. So um, they're popping up in the order that they've raised their hands and you can call on them and they can follow the instructions as you've detailed them. I see that, thank you. All right, we'll first hear from Sarah. Good afternoon. I hope you mean me, given that you haven't used my last name. But my name is Sarah McKee, pronouns she, hers. And I was a library trustee from 2009 to 2012 and trustee president my last year. I would like to mention some respects about square footage that are worth keeping in mind, I think. The figure usually used for the square footage, gross square footage of the Jones Library is 48,000 feet. In April of 2016, the trustees asked Feingold Alexander Architects, how, what was the square footage of this building if all spaces were used most efficiently? And the answer was 51,000, a 3,000 square foot difference. I would like to say that one possibility not yet considered is to restore the second floor in the former auditorium. This is right off the archive section of special collections and it would give special collections the space that it does need badly, I will say, to process incoming donations concerning local history. It's exceedingly important. And this, I asked Jim Alexander, of Feingold Alexander, whether this would be feasible. He said it would. There is an additional 2,500 square feet to be obtained if a second floor were constructed over the atrium. We all know that that has to go. And if the library were to go to geothermal heating and cooling, there would be an additional 400 square feet in the basement that would not be needed from boilers. And I have that from the head of the delightfully named Dragon Geothermal with whom I went around the library when he was assessing it for the feasibility of geothermal heating and cooling. Um, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Next, we'll hear from Lou Conover.
Angela, does Lou need to be promoted to a speaker? They're not muted, and Sarah was able to speak from the panelist room. Lou, can you unmute, please? I'm unmuted now. Thank you. I'm sorry, it took a minute. So my name is Lou Conover. I live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road in Amherst, and I go by he. Um, when I was young, when I was a young child, my family would travel have to travel more than three days to visit my grandparents, which made it a really special occasion. They lived in a house that was built in the early 20th century, not too uh, different from the time the Jones was, Jones was built. And every time we went to that house, I would see something that I hadn't noticed before, something different, something interesting. When I got a little older, I was full of questions about the house, especially about the ways in which it was different from the modern house that I was raised in and how my father's family lived in it. It was a very real education in how people from the generations before me lived. The structure itself and its details were a real living lesson that wouldn't have been possible if it had been presented as a bunch of photographs. When I first entered the Jones Library, when I moved to Amherst with my children, the first thing I noticed, which was the thing that really set the Jones apart from all the other libraries I'd been in, ever been in, was the, the millwork, the layout. It felt like a home, it felt like a house. It felt welcoming and comfortable. To me, that home-like feeling and the artistry of the surfaces and the architecture will be lost in this rush toward a sterile, blank learning, blank looking modernity. That's what I will grieve the most if this project goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for your comments. Next, we'll hear from Cameron. Uh, thank you. It's actually Carol Gray, 815 Southeast Street, Amherst. Uh, I'd like to speak to the, the law. Um, and to preface it, I'm a lawyer. I was also a Jones Library trustee. I believe I was the first person to write a Community Preservation Act uh, proposal for a funding from CPA. Uh, we signed the Preservation Restriction Agreement, the library did, and that is binding. I'm going to speak to the letter from the Mass Historic Commission, which I think is the most objective determination of whether the Secretary of the Interior standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties are being met. And I would say these standards aren't things that are just optional, <laughs> especially under the Preservation Restriction Agreement, which I understand is a different legal issue than the one we're on, but it's related. These standards are things that we should absolutely be following as a town because they're the law. So the, the letter from the, the Massachusetts Historic Commission uh, which is the most objective party and the most experienced in this room, in my view, says, regrettably, the MHC is unable to assign second certification and allocate credit to your project. And they go on to say, specifically, the proposal violates standards two, five, six, nine, and 10. And let me preface all this saying that what many people are talking about is like rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. The project never should have been proposed because it so blatantly violates the standards that it is. it has to just be simply rejected. If you care about complying with the law, you must reject it. It violates the agreement you've signed, the preservation restriction agreement. And let me speak specifically about standard nine. Standard nine says that new additions, exterior alterations and related new construction will not destroy historic materials features and spatial relationships that characterize the property. Um, it goes on to give more about size, scale, and proportion. Standard 10 says new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. There is no way that this pro proposal can ever comply with that standard. If you remove the new addition, the building is a shell, a broken form of what it once was. The law is not optional. 
you can't if a police officer says the law is 50 and you're going 70 you can't say well okay i'll go 60. no you have to comply with the law or you set up the town for a huge lawsuit it's so sad that this has gone on for so many years with people ignoring the law you can't ignore the law and the that same letter by the mass historic commission says this review okay it says there's that, no waiting room it's sorry someone's speaking at the same time it says that no uh, i didn't promote the public she just needs to raise her hand asterisk nine sorry? asterisk nine sorry angela uh, you're, you're not on mute so we can hear you speaking yeah sorry i was still speaking so the the letter sorry if i may have another 20 seconds since someone was talking at the same Carol, time. please please finish your thoughts in 30 seconds thank you so much um, so the letter, again, from the most authoritative body on mass historic preservation, the commission itself, uh, says that the a compatible addition should be smaller than the historic building in both height and footprint. This project should never have gone past square one. You need to just stop it now. It's in violation of the standards that uh, that are relevant to this hearing, but also that are the basis of the prehistoric preservation restriction agreement that is binding law for Amherst. We must comply with the secretary's standards. Five of them are being violated. You can't get around that. Stop the project now. It's illegal. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Next, we'll hear from Rob Kustner. I think I'm next year, but I'm too busy, and some people know I'm in the last. Thank you. I just found the end. Is there, is there a timer? Yes, the timer just started for three minutes. Thank you. My name is Rob Kustner. My pronoun today will be Robbie, and I'm going to begin by I, I'm a former select board member. I actually chaired the select board for a number of months between 2005, 2008. I was a member of the joint capital planning committee. I was a conservation commissioner several years earlier. Most recently, I spent a decade chairing the Commonwealth's DCR committee to rebuild, redesign, rebuild the Neurotic Rail Trail. I have a lot of experience personally in construction and also a mathematics professor at UMass. I live at 49 Ben Meter Drive. I'm going to begin with a poem, a couple of lines from a poem by my namesake, uh, Robbie Burns, who lived at the time, actually later than the construction of the nearby Stronghouse. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glad, and leave us not but grief and pain for promised joy. Roughly speaking, complicated plans often run into problems. The proposal to demolish most of the existing Jones Library's interior, to massively amend its exterior, is bound to run into the same kind of complications that any large construction project has. And as much as I like to do things to bring the world into more modern times, like create a rail trail that's 12 miles and soon to be 104 miles long. This project, unfortunately, has the potential to lead to many, 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 many more complications that will not only destroy the historic fabric of the existing building and its more modern additions, but also possibly lead to extreme cost overruns, et cetera, et cetera. I'm afraid I know this from experience. 15 years ago, the Jones Library, more than 15 years ago, the Jones Library had opportunities from funds that the Joint Capital Planning Committee put forward to begin some modernization, repairs, and so forth. I urge everybody to just step back and stop a process that could be redone in a different way. And we have an opportunity across the street from the Jones to provide a large amount of modern space that's proximate, connectable to the Jones, and that could even attract funds from other private parties 
that used to own that property decades, centuries ago. And I hope we'll look to an alternative that does not complement this Served us very well for nearly a century. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Next, we'll hear from Maria. Great, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? I am on the road. Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Kapiki, South Amherst. Uh, she, her. Those who developed the current plan knew or should have known about the standards of the interior, the Section 106 process, and uh, MGL and Code of Massachusetts regulations that protect historic properties. However, they chose not to comply with these regulations and put construction, construction documents out to bid twice without having addressed them. The MBLC bears responsibility here as well as they also disregarded state regulations to protect historic structures and threatened to rescind their funding if the plans were changed to comply with the rules. The inflexibility of a state grant process, however, is not a sufficient or ethically conscionable reason to permit these adverse effects and cannot be allowed to dictate the approach to improving the Jones. A different plan can be developed and executed that both respects historic integrity and improves the experience of patrons and staff. While adverse effects have finally been conceded, no genuine attempt has been made to either avoid or minimize them. <clears throat> Photographic documentation is not an acceptable mitigation measure. The loss of a quarter of the historic millwork, a figure that has yet to be explained, is unacceptable and avoidable. Furthermore, this library was designed to be experienced in a particular physical sense, the floor plan being central to that experience. Never during this process has there been a serious attempt to retain the floor plan and use creative measures to satisfy desirable updates. For example, the long sight lines currently in favor in modern building styles could be replaced with strategically located video cameras without knocking down multiple walls. A gross overestimation of the user population has been the driving force behind the unnecessary expansion. A rethinking of the use of the nearly 50,000 square feet of the existing building could dramatically improve accessibility and functionality. Citing programming at branch libraries and existing town buildings would also obviate the need for the oversized and incongruent expansion, thereby avoiding the adverse effect of its massing and dominance over the historic building. Buckingham Slate is still available and would avoid another adverse effect. If the exact shingles were not available, certainly another sl natural slate would be a far better choice than synthetic slate, thus minimizing the adverse effect. There is certainly no need to cut a hole in the front of an historic building for a new book drop. To date, well over 1,000 people have signed a petition calling for an end to the current project. Three out of 10 of them had previously supported it, but no longer do. Seven out of 10 cite the adverse effects on the Jones Library as a primary reason for their position. These signatories include a wide range of library users, from a young woman who moved to an apartment in town a few years ago and expressed shock and dismay at the lack of respect for an historic icon of town, to four generations of a family whose grandfather actually worked on the construction of the 1928 building. To them, and many more, the historic Jones is more than just another building, but a valued and unique re representation of the, build of the town itself. The question now is whether this process... Maria, please take a moment to wrap up your thoughts as the timer went off. Thank you. Got it. The question now is whether this process will respect and reflect those same values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Next, we'll hear from Arlie. Hello. Hi, my name is Arlie Gould. I live in South Amherst. Uh, she, hers. Um, so uh, the mitigation discussion, um, I resonated with the consulting party that talked about how the, the documentation seems a little bit of standard operating procedure and maybe doesn't uh, reflect sort of the magnitude of the adverse impact. Um, one thought I had was, if the this 25% of millwork, for example, could be instead of just demolished 
in the demolition and thrown away could be preserved in, you know, the actual woodwork um, may be then used later in the library or on some other project, historic project. Again, beyond just taking a picture, uh, which doesn't really feel like mitigation. I just would also like to say uh, the comment about the voters uh, supporting this. We hear this a lot. Uh, it's not just a few minor changes that have been made. Uh, there were solar panels before that have been jettisoned. Um, there's, you know, and also the price tag has increased by $10 million, um, which has, con you know, uh, interest payments and things associated. So we're talking about a different project that than what was voted on in 21. And I would uh, echo, there are many who used to support the project who don't anymore. So people are changing their minds. Um, but I would like to see the mitigation be a little more substantial than just taking pictures, even though I understand they're really good pictures and everything, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Arlie. The next commenter will be Arthur Keen. Mute there. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. My name is Art Keen. I use he, him pronouns. I'm Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at UMass Amherst. Early in my career, I was director of the UMass Archaeological Field School, and I worked in historic preservation across Western Mass throughout the 80s and the 90s. I'm submitting more detailed written testimony, and I hope you'll consider the details therein. For the moment, let me just speak to two of the adverse effects noted in the town's findings. First, massing. The most impactful adverse effect is that of improper massing of the addition, also cited as a concern in a letter to the sponsors from the MHC in April of this year. In my judgment, the planned new addition does violence to the building's historic character, dramatically altering its appearance and degrading the historic viewscape of the building itself, of the historic district in which it resides, and of the neighboring North Prospect Local Historic District. The proposed new addition dwarfs the historic building and the old and new architecture clash garishly and incompatibly. Contrast the proposed Jones design with the elegant architectural integration and compatibility of the recent addition to the North Amherst Library. The inappropriate style and massing is something that will awkwardly and permanently dominate the view of downtown. This clash with historic preservation sensibilities cannot be mitigated simply by taking pictures of the building. Less destructive alternatives ought to be considered. Second, the historic millwork. The plan is to remove and discard 25% of the library's historic millwork crafted from rare Philippine mahogany. The historic structures report notes that this millwork is in fine condition and contributes significantly to the character of the historic building a greater effort should be made to preserve and retain this millwork. Consulting parties have been asked to consider ways to avoid, minimize, or mitigate adverse effects, but only mitigation has been proposed by the town, and a pretty minimal mitigation at that. A comprehensive and earnest consideration of other possibilities for avoidance and minimization is required. And if time permitted, I would read a long list of suggestions for that minimization um, and avoidance. I'll submit that in writing. Finally, for many in our community, preservation of the historic character of the town's living room is a priority. A recent petition circulated by Save Our Library has yielded over a thousand signatures of people opposing the project with 67% of those citing the negative impact on historic integrity as their primary reason for opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Next, we'll hear from Green Miles Lipton, LLP. I am not Green Miles Lipton, LLP. I am Michael Pill, and I am speaking not as a member of the public, but as a member of the Board of Directors of Ancestral Bridges, I've 
had my hand up ever since long before the ending of the participants. Um, I assume that by error, I was not raised to the panel when that should have happened. And my apology, I thought that would have happened. And so I thought when I raised my hand to be allowed to speak as a participant, that that would have happened. What has struck me as a member of the board of it, and I see I'm only being given the time that members of the public are being allowed to have. Okay, um, I'll talk as fast as I can, understandably. I think it's very significant, and it's sad that so many of the people who were pictured before are no longer here to hear it, is that Anika Lopes was the only one speaking of all the people you've heard from who was saying, in effect, let's open the door to tell the history of all of Amherst. And while I was a history major, I love history, I treasure my 19th century house, those who are totally focused on the money, original slate, regardless of the cost, viewscape, size of the building, I respectfully submit, need to stop and think that in the 1920s, when this building was built, perhaps they're not aware the only people of color in Amherst were living in the smallest houses on the narrowest streets like Gaylord or McClellan Street. There were no people of color allowed on the faculty of any higher institution in this town. And there were written into many of the deeds, then legally enforceable covenants, essentially saying white Christians only. That was Amherst in the 1920s. And I respectfully submit that part of the history that has to be brought to light, brought out of the shadows, and if need be, balanced against the physical aspects, the physical historical aspects, the size of the building, whether we use original slate or not, those things need to be considered. And if there's an edge in my voice, it's because I knew and worked for many years with Anika's grandfather, Dudley Bridges, who literally beat his head against a wall in this town, trying to get the Civil War tablets out of storage. And what people may not know, but I remember standing at his gravesite, even at the end, what he was making was a plea to the entire community when he insisted that he be buried in what was formerly the segregated African-American portion of the West Cemetery. I mean, yeah, I'm a educated professional white man, but I sit on the board of Ancestral Bridges because I think all of us need to strive to realize that what America has been for us, it has not been for people of color and indigenous people, and that God help us if we have to choose between original slate or something different or the mass of the building or physical changes that we will choose to recognize and include the history of everyone whose labor as slaves, whatever, helped create the community we have today. And the final thing, as a child of an immigrant family, I wouldn't be where I am today were it not for the public library in my town. Um, I think one or two people, Sarah Barr, for example, commented on the need to make a library for the 21st century that opens the door for a window on the world to those people who cannot afford in their own homes the resources that so many of us take for granted. Uh, that's something we really need to think about. I, I, I treasure the history as a history major, um, but by golly, if we have to choose, let's choose a library that opens the door, makes Amherst a place of opportunity for everyone in the 21st century and recognizes the history of everyone who for so long have been completely ignored. And I do thank you for the opportunity to speak. All I can say is, I hope, because just about everyone has now left who was here during the participant, 
that my comments, which I assume are being recorded, will be passed on to the other people. I'm, I'm basically pleading with you, okay? We owe it to the slaves who were buried in this valley and to the bones of the natives who were murdered by the English invaders. Um, we can't change that history, but we can come to terms with it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we, we gave you some extra time. I'm not sure how that omission happened earlier, but I'm sorry that that happened. It, it may have been my fault because I, I couldn't figure out how to change Green Miles Lipton. So, you know, that's my side, your side, and the right side, my grandpa used to say. Thank you for the opportunity. And I hope my comments will be passed on to the, you know, many people who are here for the participant part who have, who have now left. And thank you very much. Thank you for your time uh, and your comments. And we'll now hear from Hilda Greenbaum. Thank you very much. I'm, I, I, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Uh, you're coming through now. Okay. Um, I'm speaking extemporaneously because so many things I was going to say have already been said. But I would like to say that I, I have been living in this valley for 70 years. Coming this came as a freshman to Mount Holyoke 70 years ago and left to get a PhD for a couple of years and essentially married and been in this town from 1960. Been, um, anyway, I've known to Jones Library 70 of its 98 years, and I remember when there were antique clocks there and other and local furniture and anti uh, oriental rugs on the floor and those days have passed. And essentially I, I agree with the, the need for space for the special collections and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I support a, a large library and I would be willing to donate money to a library that was not this one. This one was a mistake. You chose the wrong architect. A little bit more about myself is that we have, my husband and I had a company named Historic Enterprises, which I've worked in for the last 30 years. We have restored several dozen or more old houses, put them back on the tax rolls. And so I've done a lot of construction over the years. I've learned a lot about architecture over the years. And I agree with all the people who talk about the massing and, and that building that looks like a barn is totally wrong. It needs, uh, starting with the, with the gambrel roof, the angles could at least be the same angles as the one on the Jones Library. It wouldn't stand out like such a sore thumb. In, in, in terms of mitigation, um, I have a 1737 house. We had the original windows reproduced um, 70, 50 years ago. And, and then more recently, I had those same windows retrofitted with double layer glass with uh, gas in between that layers so that they are all weather tight, but they are the original reproductions of the original windows, which I was told is a lot less expensive than, than building new windows. Anyway, so I, I would suggest taking the windows that you have there and finding the company. I had found the company that did all the windows at Yale, for example, and that was, um, Connecticut by glass. So people are available that can do a really nice job and make them look like the original windows. Um, 
Hilda, your time, your timer went off. So can you please? Yeah, up? well, I, I have said essentially what I want to say that I agree with all of the preservationists here who find this building horrible and insensitive to the building around it and insensitive to the Jones Library. Send it back for um, better designs that minimizes the impact of that. Or I'd, I'd like to get rid of that building all, all together and just keep the one in the back for the expansion. I think that would be the best mitigation is to not have that, what I call a barn on the west side, which ruins the, the stone. Okay, whatever. Okay, thank you, Hilda, I appreciate it. And I saw that Rob had his hand raised, but Rob, I think you already spoke and we're, we're only inviting members of the public to speak once for the three minutes that were allotted. Uh, but there will be an opportunity to uh, include any written commentary on the town's website. Thank you. Yes, we, we are. Oh, I see Paul has raised his hand. Yes, Paul. Uh, just to, could you comment for the public how many people are, are in the attendance wing of this uh, meeting so people know how many people are here? Yes, certainly. There are currently 40 attendees. I've seen that number go up and down um, over the course of the meeting. So um, it at one point it was closer to 48, I believe, but it is presently 40. So we want to thank everybody for contributing their feedback and their input into this process. Um, we're going to show the slide once more that has the website where members of the public and consulting parties can submit written comment to the town for its consideration in the drafting of the memorandum of agreement. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see the website where you can submit written comment. I'm going to turn the floor back over to Austin to conclude the building committee committee meetings agenda. Thank you very much. We appreciated hearing from you all. Austin, we can't hear you, although it doesn't look Thank like you're you. muted. Thank you to the consulting parties. Thank you to the members of the public that spoke. Uh, great thanks to um, Ginny and Mara and your colleagues. Uh, there are no items not anticipated 48 hours in advance. So uh, the, this meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee is adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>